Final 7-1 November Papa, you're going to be my last ever. Do you know that? Hey, Mike, that's you. It is. Who's that? Ah, uh, that's Paul. Ah, uh, listen, then. I'm delighted. Listen, this is my last one. I'm going today, and it's been great. So for the last time for me, minus 7 one November Papa, suffers when 350 degrees, 1, 2 knots, runway 28, clear takeoff, and everybody stay safe out there, okay? Thank you very much, Amos. It's been a pleasure working with you, or rather, listening to you in, uh, during these years. Uh, have uh, all the best, all the very best, and we are cleared for takeoff runway 28, runner 7 1, November Papa. Long last. Sound like you have a good one, all right? Hello again, and welcome back to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips to help keep you safe when you fly. I'm Max Truscott. Today, we're talking about low-altitude flight and buzzing, because there seems to be a lot of it, and it's probably more dangerous than you think. And I'll pass along a couple of tips for doing it right, or maybe for not doing it at all. By the way, if you have thought about maybe someday buying a Cirrus SR-20, SR-22, or SF-50 Vision Jet, or you would like flight training in any of these aircraft, there's so much I can help you with. Just give me a call, 650-967-2500, for a free consultation and possibly a free demo flight. Now, last week in episode 111, we talked about icing and deadly tailplane stalls. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out. This week in the news, an FAA safety inspector has been found guilty of taking thousands of dollars in cash bribes. And a pilot was charged with felony assault for using an airplane as a deadly weapon. All this and more, and the news starts now. Now, this is the first of a series of stories that came out over the past week. This comes from KTVU Channel 2 in Oakland. A search is underway for a plane that crashed into Lake Tulloch. Search is underway for a small plane that crashed Sunday after hitting power lines at Lake Tulloch in Calaveras County. Authorities said that an eyewitness reported the plane hit the power lines at about 11.45 a.m. and went into the lake nose first near the Poker Flat area and quickly sank. Separately from Sacramento, uh, CBS Local News, a number of witnesses mentioned that the power lines stretching across the lake were not marked and the pilot likely didn't see them. One bystander said, from where we're standing, they're hard to see. Those wires, they're not marked, so there's nothing to indicate there are wires there. Other residents at the far end of the lake were surprised to see the low-flying plane. Danielle Girardelli watched the crash unfold from her kitchen window. It's going so slow and hit the wire and the wing hit the cable and it just went down like that, she said. Residents said the pilot was putting on a show for friends and relatives who were filming him from below on a pontoon boat. Susan Shaw, a witness, talked to some of the heartbroken friends. She said they told us the plane was coming in doing a flyby to say hello to their family like it was pre-scheduled. And just two days ago from the Union Democrat after the aircraft had been recovered, they identified the 63-year-old pilot who was flying a Piper PA-11, which struck power lines. According to people who knew the pilot, he was flying from Columbia Airport, where the Father's Day fly-in was underway, and he intended to fly over Tulloch Reservoir when the crash occurred. Witnesses said he did a flyby and a wing dip for people watching, then struck power lines and plummeted nose first into the reservoir. Now, reading those stories about the crash reminded me about other accidents in which pilots were flying low and hit wires, which is why I'll be talking about buzzing and low-altitude flight as our main topic today. By the way, one of the stories said that the accident pilot's father-in-law, who was a flight instructor, died 13 years earlier in a plane crash. Back in 2006, he was flying an experimental amateur-built hooker Zenith. According to the NTSB, it was a Zodiac 601XL. The probable cause of that accident was structural failure of the wings for undetermined reasons. So unfortunately, tragedy has struck this family yet again, and our heart goes out to them. From the MiamiHerald.com, an FAA safety inspector found guilty of taking thousands in cash bribes from an aviation contractor. South Florida aviation safety inspector accused of pocketing more than $150,000 from a federal contractor in exchange for costly repair manuals and inspection alerts was found guilty of a bribery conspiracy and multiple related charges. Manuel R. Fernandez, who was convicted of taking the cash bribes for more than three years as an FAA inspector, arranged for his mother to work as a ghost employee for the FAA certified contractor to receive some of the payments for him, according to evidence at his corruption trial in Miami. After four hours of deliberation, the 12-person federal jury found that Fernandez didn't disclose that he was working on the side for the avionics electronics repair company and didn't reveal the money he made in unlawful bribes while employed by the FAA between 2010 and mid-2013. In exchange for the payoffs, the jury found Fernandez supplied a variety of aviation maintenance manuals that normally cost from 
$100 to $15,000 to Avcom Avionics and Instruments in Doral, according to court records. He also provided insider information about pending FAA safety inspections of a warehouse facility, which specialized in repairing aviation electronics equipment. Fernandez, 41, is scheduled for sentencing before U.S. District Court Marsha Cook on August 28. He faces up to 10 years in prison. He remains free on bail, though the judge imposed new bond conditions, including requiring the convicted defendant to wear an electronic ankle bracelet and obey an 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. curfew. Fernandez, who had worked at the FAA for seven years and earned more than $100,000 annually, was charged in 2017. The U.S. Attorney's Office, along with federal agents from the FBI, made the case against Fernandez by flipping a co-owner of Avcom, Rolando Suarez, who was sentenced to two years in prison. His ex-wife, Parisha Suarez, also an Avcom co-owner, pleaded guilty and was sentenced to five years probation before Fernandez's trial. Both were ordered to repay the U.S. government more than $700,000, including money from the bribery scheme. The company is still in business, but under different management. From FlyingMag.com, Daher buys Quest Aircraft. Daher, the French maker of the TBM family of sleek and speedy single-engine turboprops, said it will purchase Sandpoint, Idaho-based Quest Aircraft, which builds the Kodiak 100 utility turboprop. The acquisition, Daher says, strengthens two of the company's strategic pillars by boosting its market position in the turboprop segment and growing its footprint in North America. Quote, the Quest Aircraft Company's acquisition represents an additional step in our development in the U.S. and an overall strengthening of our aircraft manufacturing business, said Daher CEO Didier Kayat. In addition to making Daher the world's seventh largest aircraft manufacturer in business aviation, it provides us with our first industrial site in the U.S. The Kodiak 100 is a 10-seat, non-pressurized high-wing turboprop, while the TBM 910 and 940 are luxurious and fast-pressurized turboprops. The Kodiak competes most closely with the Cessna Caravan and the TBM with the Piper's M600 and Textron Aviation's forthcoming Denali. Daher Chairman Patrick Daher said, It's a powerful and maneuverable aircraft used particularly for humanitarian missions to provide aid in isolated communities. The Kodiak 100 perfectly complements our TBM product range and is fully in line with Daher's long-term vision as a company committed to the future of aviation. The acquisition's closing is expected to be completed by the end of the year, subject to approval by the regulatory authorities in both countries. And in a related story from AINonline.com, Daher launches student competition to spur TBM innovations. Daher Aerospace, the French manufacturer of TBM turboprop singles, is highlighting at the Paris Air Show its recently launched student innovation competition called the General Aviathon, which is aimed at developing technologies that can make its aircraft more autonomous, intelligent, and connected. The contest is conducted through Daher's Silicon Valley-based innovation program, Armstrong by Daher, which is tasked with accelerating our parent company's digital transformation, said Daher's head of digital strategy, Florent Francois. And there is no better way than harnessing Silicon Valley's imagination and capability for a future transformation of the TBM aircraft. Daher's competition challenges student teams to develop computing capabilities, artificial intelligence processes, and other software. Mentors are available to tutor students on the TBM's operational and system aspects, as well as provide insights from the pilot and passenger perspectives. The winning team will receive a cash prize of $5,000 and the potential to partner with Daher in deploying these technologies. Daher listed several potential topics that could be covered in the general aviathon, including how can the TBM be improved with embedded artificial intelligence, what kind of vocal assistant could be relevant to its pilots, how the TBM can be given real-time computing capability, and which technologies would improve the aircraft's performance. Selected teams will move forward to the test and presentation phases before a final pitch and determination of the winners to be announced at the NBAA conference in October in Las Vegas. From simpleflying.com, a California startup successfully flies a hybrid electric aircraft. California startup called Ampere, that's A-M-P-A-I-R-E, has successfully flown their attempt at a hybrid aircraft. The plane is based on the Cessna 337 Skymaster, which a lot of pilots know is kind of a push-pull twin-engine aircraft with one engine in the front and one engine in the back. And what Ampere has done is they have left the normal, uh, normally aspirated engine up in the front of the aircraft, but they have converted the rear engine to an electric engine. While companies look to reduce CO2 emissions, the industry is increasingly looking toward electric aircraft. And of course, we've talked a lot about electric aircraft on this show. When electricity is generated using renewable sources, the flight is deemed to be carbon neutral. However, the problem for now is creating the capacity to power an engine for a whole flight. 
As such, the majority of electric aircraft projects are currently confined to small aircraft up to 10 seats. Ampere flew the hybrid Cessna 337 on June 6th. The first flight of the hybrid electric aircraft took place at Camarillo, a popular GA airport to the west of Los Angeles. While the aircraft is in use is 46 years old, it's received a new lease on life with its high-tech electric engine. Ampere hopes that following two years of testing with the FAA, the aircraft can commence commercial flights. In fact, the company hopes that small regional airlines in need of six-seat aircraft will operate their planes. As such, they are currently targeting operations in Maui, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. If Ampere's hybrid Cessna 337 proves to be successful, there's a possibility that they could work on scaling the technology to larger aircraft. It also shows the industry that this is possible and challenges them to react to climate change. From FlyingMag.com, the Light aircraft facility in Wichita was destroyed by fire. Light aircraft, makers of the popular Chipper and Chipper 2 single-engine aircraft kits, and by the way, we've talked about the Chipper on this show in the past, Belight said their facility on the northeast side of the air capital in Wichita was destroyed by fire. The blaze apparently began when the dust collection system on our CNC router was working overtime making parts for kits, according to James Wiebe, Belight's president. The company's offices and items taller than six feet above the ground were melted or burned, including raw inventory and a collection of parts for older aircraft designs on the second floor. B-Light's chipper demo aircraft only escaped destruction because it was still sitting at the local airport. Tragically, James and Kathy Wiebe's two cats who lived at the factory did not survive the blaze. Wiebe said, our team had just shipped four airframe kits and we're getting ready to ship another batch this month, along with many backorder parts for customers. I've been working hard on an Air Force contract and my sole working sample was found in the debris of my office. Wiebe said he expected to meet with the insurance adjusters soon. From avweb.com comes the story that one of the Garmin co-founders has passed away. Garmin co-founder and chairman emeritus Gary Burrell passed away at the age of 81. Burrell and Min Keo founded the company in 1989 with the idea of creating products that use then-emergent GPS technology. After his retirement in 2002, Burrell served as Garmin's co-chairman until being named chairman emeritus in 2004. Quote, Gary Burrell has been my friend, mentor, and partner for more than 30 years, said Keo. His vision, values, engineering skills, and commitment to serving our customers have been the foundation for the growth of our company. It has been both a privilege and a blessing to have known this amazing man, and I know his legacy will live on. Before co-founding Garmin, he worked at companies including Lawrence Electronics, King Radio Corporation, and Allied Signal. According to Garmin, the company now employs more than 13,000 employees in 60 offices around the world. From iPadPilotNews.com, Apero buys the AeroV app and plans an iOS app expansion. Aviation hardware company Apero, manufacturer of the Stratus line of ADSB receivers and transponders, is purchasing AeroV, the developer of full-featured EFB, that's electronic flight bag apps. And by the way, I have purchased AeroV in the past, and we've talked about it on this show. AeroV, by the way, is spelled A-E-R-O-V-I-E. According to Apero, the current AeroV app users will not experience a disruption in their service during the acquisition, and the app will continue to offer its full set of features like AHARs and synthetic vision, VFR sectional, IFR low and high charts, and georeference approach charts at the same subscription pricing. AeroV is a solid app with some unique capabilities like its PyRep submission feature, radar forecast, and a vertical weather profile tool. And by the way, the, that latter is the reason I bought the app. I like to be able to see the different cloud layers depicted and how thick they are. That turned out to be really helpful for some of the long cross-country trips I've done moving a Cirrus aircraft across the country. The article continues that while it never had a huge following, it's powerful and easy to use and worth a look at. AeroV users can expect to see some growth in the app in the near future, as Apero intends to incorporate several of the features they developed for their own app, Stratus Horizon Pro, into AeroV. Introduced last year, Stratus Horizon Pro offers pilots helpful tools, including backup AHARs and radio playback that captures air traffic control communications and saves them for easy one-touch playback. Additionally, there's a beta feature in the Stratus app called Radio Transcription, which converts ATC communications into text that's displayed directly above the audio playback line. Apero is best known, though, for its line of Stratus ADSB receivers, which are the most widely used portable weather receivers among pilots today. The latest model, the Stratus 3, works well with AeroV thanks to its open architecture. 
Apparel plans to further expand compatibility for existing Stratus owners by updating the Aero V app to work with Stratus 2, 1S, 2S, and 2i as well, providing another app options for pilots flying with one of these ADSB receivers. And finally, from our Dumb Pilot Tricks file, and I want to thank Isaac Alexander for sending this one to me. This comes from kitsapsun.com, which I think is a newspaper up in the Seattle area. It says that a Port Ludlow man, which is going to be northwest of Seattle, was charged with felony assault for using an airplane as a weapon. The 56-year-old Jefferson County man, reportedly drunk, was charged Thursday with felony assault after he allegedly drove a small airplane at people near a private airport in Silverdale. On Wednesday, a man teaching a motorcycle class near Apex Air Park off Anderson Hill Road called Kitsap County to report the Port Ludlow man had tried to hit him with the airplane. The airplane remained on the ground during the incident and did not take off. The man told deputies that Jeffrey Wilfred Dorsey, who he described as intoxicated and obnoxious, had approached him in a vehicle and yelled at him and his students, saying that they were, quote, running down his property values, according to court documents. Dorsey allegedly returned a few minutes later in a small white airplane, driving it toward the crowd of students. The teacher and students moved out of the way, but after cutting the engine briefly to yell and curse at them, Dorsey allegedly drove the airplane at the crowd again, according to court documents. Like before, the teacher and students moved out of the way, and Dorsey left the area in the plane. Quote, when he saw the blades of the propeller spinning and coming at him, he believed Dorsey was going to hit him with a plane, a deputy wrote of the teacher who armed himself with a gun, thinking Dorsey might return. Deputies received a search warrant for the hangar owned by Dorsey, and after breaking down the door, they found him on a couch in a back room where he had been sleeping and did not hear deputies knocking. Dorsey was charged with second jury assault and was booked into the Kitsap County Jail, which, by the way, I think is probably a pretty good place for him, where he's being held on $200,000 bail. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, my weekly updates. And then we'll get to our main topic about buzzing and low-altitude flight. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And welcome back. Let me give you a few quick updates. First, let's talk about the AOPA fly-in in Livermore, California. What a great turnout. Now, I heard that they had more people pre-registered for this fly-in than for any of the prior fly-ins. The weather was excellent, a little bit on the warm side. Uh, one of the big events there was the stole or short takeoff and landing demonstration. Now, for this, the airport was closed for an hour and a half at noon on Sunday, and there were about 10, maybe 12 aircraft that flew in that demonstration. Now, they would land on Taxiway Alpha, then turn right into the grass and taxi onto runway 25 right to line up again for takeoff from Taxiway Alpha. And once in the air, they would fly a small right traffic pattern at what to me looked like to be maybe, I don't know, four or 500 feet AGL, and then come back and land again. Now, the biggest attraction of the group was Draco. That's a large red Wilga. Now, if you don't know what a Wilga is, that was a Polish short takeoff and landing aircraft that was built in the 1960s. It's a tail dragger. I've always thought it's very distinctive because it's got very long main front landing gear, so the nose sticks up pretty high. The owner is Mike Patey, and in 2017, he had an engine failure of the standard 260 horsepower Russian engine, and he just barely got the plane into a cornfield. But that then gave him the opportunity to make some modifications he'd been thinking of. So now Draco sports a PT6 turboprop, large 35-inch tires, and a 4,000 foot per minute climb rate. Now here's what Draco sounded like at Livermore this past weekend. And then I'm not sure it needs much introduction, but Mike Patey from Salt Lake City, Utah, in the big, overstated, fire engine red, fire breathing dragon, make some noise for Draco! I don't think Draco wants to land. I think we've given him almost a round of applause that he needs to fly again. So let's make some noise for this dragon. We'll see if we can get him to make another pattern. Ladies and gentlemen, let's let Draco know we want another round. Draco, 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 Draco. Come on, let's see it. Smoke on.
What a beautiful day to have a flying demonstration like this. I think it gave us some real world conditions, Mike. This is yeah. this is not a, a laboratory. This is the real world. Yeah. Last night we had the uh, last night we had the wind right down the runway, which is perfect for a stole competition in the sense that uh, it helps these folks land short and take off short. Today we had the challenge. And the challenge was for these folks to uh, work their airplanes to the pretty close to the limit of their their abilities. And they did a nice job. Wonderful job. And again, these are all stick and rudder skills that you can build on and you can go and fly these types of airplanes. This isn't out of reach for pretty much any pilot. If you're going to dedicate yourself to wanting to uh, be able to acquire these skills, this is just uh, the peak demonstration of the skills we all learn, all these fundamentals that we learn when we get our private pilot certificate. That's right. And you can, you can do this kind of flying with just about any airplane. It's not only the pilot, uh, it's the airplane. And um, the pilot develops the, once a pilot develops the skills, here's Draco. What an incredible display. Thank you, Mike Patey. Thank you to all our stole demonstration pilots. Thank you so much, Livermore. And at the very end there, you heard Mike Patey put the 104-inch MT prop into beta so that he can uh, get some reverse thrust right after he touches down to really shorten his landing distance. So great seeing Draco and the other aircraft there. By the way, I found a great article that talks about the many modifications that Mike made to this plane, and I'll include a link to it in the show notes. Now, on Friday, I was on the main stage, and I had a large crowd for my How to Fly the San Francisco Bay Tour seminar. If you emailed me earlier this year about buying one of those maps, I'll be mailing those out to you soon. And if you haven't emailed me, but you'd like to buy one of the San Francisco Bay Tour maps, just email me by going to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page and send me an email. I also spoke on Saturday morning for three hours and had probably about 60 people in my advanced IFR for GPS receivers presentation. And then we had a big meetup on Friday evening for Aviation News Talk listeners at the Starbucks that's right next to the Livermore Airport. And I want to give a big thank you to everyone who attended. That included Ed Varso, who is one of our Patreon supporters. He's with the Riverside Pilots Flying Club, and he flew up with Jeremy from Southern California. Ed mentioned that the club is upgrading the avionics in at least one of their airplanes, a Cessna 182, and that they've just decided to put in a Garmin GFC 500 autopilot. And we'll be talking more about autopilots soon on an upcoming episode of Aviation News Talk. Bob Luton of Pleasanton was there. Brian Deere, who is one of our Patreon supporters, and his wife Jessica attended. Brian just finished his private and is looking to buy a Cirrus, and Jessica plans to start her private in August. So they're going to be a flying family, which sounds like fun. Lyman Howard came down from Petaluma. Bill Ayer, another uh, Patreon supporter, flew down from Seattle in his Malibu, and he brought two friends over to the Starbucks uh, with him. One was Steve Fulton, who flies for Alaska Airlines, and Kevin Wells of Atherton. We also had Matt Gardner up from Van Nuys in Southern California. And we had two German guys who live in Santa Cruz. So that would be Dirk Kongeiser and Thomas Dienwebel. So there were probably a couple of other names that I may have missed, in which case I apologize. But thanks, everybody, for coming out to our meetup. Great fun to meet uh, more listeners. And on Sunday, after the AOPA event, I had a really long lunch at the Watsonville Airport with Scott Denstedt, who you probably know as a weather expert, who's been on the show a couple of times and recently written a weather book. And Robert De Laurentiis, who's already flown around the world once and is planning to do it again later this year. Uh, but this time he plans to do it by flying over the poles, which is a much more difficult flight, uh, particularly because of the leg that uh, takes you from St. George Island, south of uh, Chile, all the way down to uh, Antarctica, to the South Pole and back. Now, it was really a fascinating couple of hours sharing stories among the three of us and two of our wives as well. And I just wish I'd recorded the conversation as there were so many good learning moments which is really why it's so important for pilots to tell stories because we all learn from the experiences of others and that helps prevent us from making the same mistakes. And along those lines, last week I gave a presentation on icing to all the flight instructors at the West Valley Flying Club, sharing with them what I know about icing. And afterwards, three different CFIs came up to me to tell me their icing horror stories. And I think my conclusion is that icing is highly variable. Sometimes it's benign and sometimes it's deadly. And those of us who've had encounters with severe icing in the past 
and we're lucky enough to survive, now do whatever we can to avoid it because we know how dangerous it is. And if you're one of those pilots who's had some encounters with icing in the past and they've just been light icing and you now feel comfortable flying in the ice, boy, you really need to listen to people's stories about the scary encounters with ice and start avoiding ice so that someday you don't end up in an icing situation that exceeds the capabilities of your airplane. Speaking of icing, I want to thank Graham who sent me a message via Facebook and he sent a link to the NASA icing video, which I had referred to in episode 111, but which I hadn't previously seen. And going through that, I was able to see that when they recovered from the tailplane stall, the maximum pressure they had to apply to the yoke was 156 pounds of pressure. Now, earlier in the week, I had stopped in a local store and I saw one of the front page stories on the Wall Street Journal. It was written by Andy Pastores, who does a lot of writing on aviation topic. And the headline was, Return of 737 MAX Runs into New Hurdles. Efforts to get the Boeing 737 MAX jetliners back in the air have been delayed in part by concerns about whether the average pilot has enough physical strength to manually crank a flight control wheel in extreme emergencies. The crank adjusts the angle of the horizontal stabilizer, which the MCAS system can crank down to dangerous levels. In one of the 737 crashes, it was reported that the crew tried to turn the knob but were unable to, partially because the plane was at full throttle. Had it been at lower throttle setting, the knob might have been easier to turn. All of which makes me think about episode 111 when we talked about tailplane stalls and how they said it could take up to 400 pounds of pressure in some aircraft to raise the nose on a tailplane stall. Now, physical strength isn't something we typically think that we're going to need when we're flying, but there are some corner cases where you might not have the physical strength needed to do something in the plane. In the NASA tailplane stall video, which I'm going to include in our show notes, the aircraft was instrumented so they could see how many pounds of pressure it took to raise the nose. And of course, in that case, it was just over 150 pounds. But they had two NASA pilots in the front seat, so they were able to do that. But imagine it's just you trying to pull with more than 100 pounds of pressure on the yoke or the Cirrus just on the single side stick. You know, it's going to be difficult to get both hands around that. So we need to avoid situations that may exceed the capabilities of the airplane or our own physical capabilities, which is yet another reason why you need to escape icing when you encounter it. Because if you ice up and have a tailplane stall, you might not be strong enough to pull the nose back up afterwards. Now, let me briefly mention our Patreon supporters. We've got a number of new ones. And if you want to join and help support the show at the $4 a month level, you'll get copies of the scripts for each of our new shows. And at the $8 a month level, you also get links to all the stories we didn't get to cover in the news because of time constraints. And this week, there were about 10 stories that didn't make it into the news. We also have a large number of super supporters who donate $20 a month, and all of them are listed in the show notes posted on Patreon for every news show. Now, we also have a very small number of core supporters who donate $50 a month or more, and those include Tyson Weiss, who's a co-founder of Forflight, Victor Vogel, he lives in Central PA and flies a Cirrus, Tim Delaney, who's been flying for nearly 50 years and flies at SR-22 in Northern California, Larry Noe from New York, New York, where I used to live. He has flown a Bonanza G36, but he tells me he just bought a Cirrus. And Lance Fletcher, he's a former crew chief in the Air Force on the F-111F. He says he's wanted to learn to fly for a decade, and he's finally taking the plunge. So congratulations to him. And congratulations to our new supporters who joined us in the last couple of weeks. They include Jason Mormiel, Brett Ross, Kyle Miller, Ed Vaughn, Todd Martin, Kevin Bramer, who added his pledge up to $4 a month, then Greg Boone. Thanks so much for supporting the show, and thank you for your support, no matter how you support the show, whether it's leaving us a review on the Apple Podcast app or where you listen to podcasts, or whether it's sending your feedback or questions to the show or donating through Patreon. Of course, you can also now donate through PayPal, and you can do that by going to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. Coming up next, our main topic on buzzing and low-altitude flight, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Let's talk about low altitude flight and buzzing. This topic was in my mind as in the news, I mentioned an aircraft here in Northern California that hit some wires and crashed into a lake. These kinds of accidents fall into a category known as maneuvering accidents. And maneuvering accidents include all those that involve deliberate sharp control inputs from turns in the traffic pattern to circling during low altitude sightseeing to aerobatics. Typically, maneuvering accidents occur below 1,000 feet AGL. I went out to AOPA's Air Safety Institute website. They've got a page that's dedicated to maneuvering accidents where they summarized all the accidents over a 10-year period. 
And from 2009 through 2018, there were nearly 400 accidents that involved aircraft striking wires, structures, or terrain, which means buzzing is the second most common form of maneuvering accidents. Stall and loss of control accidents were number one, and there were 430 of those in the same period. And just to round out the maneuvering accident category, there were also 120 aerobatic incidents and 25 accidents in canyons and mountains. So maneuvering accidents are the most common type of GA accident, and flying low and hitting wires and structures is the second most common type of maneuvering accident. In AOPA's Safety Advisory on Maneuvering Flight, it says that fully 32% of all maneuvering accidents are attributable to buzzing or flying close to the ground. Now, based on 400 of these accidents over 10 years, that means we've got about 40 accidents a year where people are buzzing and they, things go badly and there's an accident. Now, that's a lot when you figure many of these people had no good reason for flying close to the ground other than they thought it would be a fun thing to do. And I'm sure everyone who was involved in those accidents thought that they were an excellent pilot and that nothing would happen to them when they chose to fly close to the ground. But I can bet you this, I bet 100% of them, if they were given a do-over, would never go buzzing close to the ground again. Now, the accident I mentioned in the news got me thinking about other accidents I'm familiar with where aircraft have hit wires and crashed. Now, the accident that hit closest to home for me occurred just a couple of years ago. The accident pilot was a retired airline pilot who I met when he first gave me my first demo flight in a Columbia 400 aircraft. He was a dealer for the company, and I think that flight was probably in about 2005. I remember it because as I was descending, he told me I had to slow below 200 knots, and I was surprised and asked why, and he reminded me that we had to slow to that speed when operating under the Class B. Now, up to that point, I'd just been flying Cessnas and had never had to slow before in a descent. Later in the year, I started teaching in Cirrus aircraft, and of course, those are equally fast. I last talked with the accident pilot at a local banquet for the Aero Club of Northern California, and that was just three weeks before he died in the crash. Now, the circumstances of the crash really disturbed me. He was in his Cessna 140, and he was flying low up a valley when he hit some wires about 300 feet above the ground, crashed, and died. Now, tragically, his 18-year-old granddaughter was also on board, and she also died. According to the NTSB report, the pilot, who was 69, had an ATP, a CFI certificate, and reported on his last medical that he had 22,000 total flight hours. Sometime later, I talked with a pilot who'd gone to college with him at San Jose State some 50 years earlier, and she commented that, quote, he always liked to chase cows. And I was just stunned when she said that. It really boggles my mind that a professional pilot would do that. But if he'd been doing it for 50 years and had succeeded in doing it for perhaps 50 times, I'm sure it was easy for him to imagine that he would always get away with it. But sadly, he killed not only himself, but his granddaughter as well. Now, I remember vividly another low buzzing accident that occurred a few years earlier. There have been very, very few fatal accidents in the Diamond DA-40. It's a very safe aircraft. And I've given hundreds of hours of dual instruction in the Diamond DA-40, and it's a great plane. But in 2007, I remember well when one of those aircraft was lost because someone else who was buzzing, this time over a lake. Here's what the NTSB report says. The pilot telephoned an acquaintance who was boating on a lake and informed him that he planned to overfly the lake. At the end of the evening's civil twilight, witnesses observed the airplane approach the lake. The pilot telephoned the acquaintance and asked him to shine a light toward the airplane to facilitate being located on the lake. Other recreational boaters in the vicinity reported observing the airplane perform low-altitude maneuvers, including a steep pull-up and a 70-degree angle bank. Witnesses estimated that some maneuvers were performed within a wingspan or two above the lake. The witnesses said the engine was not sputtering and sounded really strong. During one of the buzzing maneuvers, the airplane descended into the lake, fragmented, and sank. The accident occurred minutes after the end of civil twilight with a marginally visible horizon. A majority of the wreckage, to include the engine, was not recovered. I get this. The pilot held, yep, an ATP certificate. and Both he and the non-pilot passengers were killed. And he'd reported on his last medical that he had 10,000 hours of flight experience. So that's two buzzing accidents where both pilots held the highest level pilot certificate and had more than 10,000 hours of experience. So somehow, even some of our best trained pilots with the highest level pilot certificate think it's okay to fly close to the ground, and yet they lack the skills to do it successfully. And here's a recent story from FlyingMag.com, that's Flying Magazine. In the late afternoon of October 13, 2017, a 300-hour pilot, age 47, with his wife in the seat beside him, was flying westward below treetop level over the Mississippi River alongside the town of Ramsey, Minnesota. 
He banked gently left to follow a bend in the river. Perhaps he was blinded by the low sun. Perhaps there was no time to react. His Cessna 172 struck power lines 40 feet above the surface and plunged into the water. This pilot took particular pleasure in low-altitude flying. Even as a student pilot, he had triggered calls to the police for buzzing his house. He liked to phone his instructor, who was a personal friend, to report his latest reckless stunts. The instructor tried to persuade him to be more careful, but the pilot shrugged him off, saying, You realize I'm going to die in an aircraft one day. Well, the instructor suggested at least he should not take his wife or son with him. The NTSB blamed the accident, which killed both the pilot and his wife, on, quote, the pilot's decision to fly along the river at low altitude, contrary to applicable regulations and safety of flight considerations. That pilot's addiction to low flight over water was similar to that of an almost 17,000-hour ATP age 73 pilot who was in the habit of making low passes over a friend's house on Lake Darbun in Louisiana. On the day that his fate finally caught up with him, he was alone in his Cessna 150 and, according to a witness, had been flying low over the lake for about an hour. He crossed over a western arm of the lake, flying south to north at a height of 5 to 10 feet. Several witnesses gave slightly conflicting accounts of what happened next. One thought the engine stumbled slightly. Two did not recall any unusual sound. The 150 wobbled or pitched up and then down. Either the nose wheel or the left main touched the water, followed by the left wingtip. The plane cartwheeled, then sank in shallow water a few hundred feet offshore. The pilot's friend rushed out in a boat to help, but were unable to reach him. So, by the way, if you've ever seen a video of a plane that's flying so low over the water that its wheels are actually touching the water, please don't even consider going out and doing that yourself. What you probably don't realize is that those aircraft are usually equipped with special low-pressure tires. And if you were to try it with normal airplane tires, yeah, you'd almost certainly kill yourself. Now, these stories we've just talked about are about pilots who didn't have to fly low but chose to anyway. But let's hear now from an expert whose job requires that he fly low for a living. This comes from AviationSafetyMagazine.com. It says, Taking low-level flying a bit too lightly, meanwhile, is the biggest pet peeve for George Parker. He's a third-generation pilot and second-generation ag pilot with 20,000 hours, more than 15,000 of them as an ag pilot. Quote, We work in the wire environment, said Parker. I have hit them when I know where they are, know how to see them, and am actively looking for and trying to avoid them. He's had two wire strikes. He says that is one wire strike for every 7,500 hours of low-level flight. Both times Parker was able to fly the airplane back to bases after hitting wires. There are always a few examples where pilots get lucky, said Parker, but in general, wires will slice the plane in half, typically resulting in fatalities. Pilots flying low over rivers often haven't scattered the route for wire hazards, and they certainly aren't prepared for a watery crash. Quote, it's hard enough to open the door of an upside-down crashed airplane, said Parker. Now wrap it in wire and toss it in a river. If the door is on the upstream side of the current, it's not going to open. The sad thing about wire strikes is that they happen every year. They are usually fatal and are almost entirely avoidable, he added. I may have been to the same field a dozen times already, but each time I scout it like it's the first time, he said. He described circling 150 feet above a field he'd been to many times already that season. It was clear of obstacles, but while circling, he almost ran into a newly placed communication tower in the field next door. I caught it while glancing forward momentarily. I thought I was safe at 150 feet and just worried about stuff at 10 feet in my target field. It was a lucky catch. You can't be too careful. Now, I read another article in AviationSafetyMagazine.com and it explains part of the problem. It says, how can we fix this? For instance, we can't stop pilots from engaging in low-level flying, especially since it can be a valuable mission. The problem isn't that we're flying low at low altitude. The problem is that we suck at it. Now, I know that you're most likely a pilot or student pilot, and you've had some flight training and probably more than 100 hours of dual instruction. I want you to think right back now through that 100 or more hours of flight instruction that you've had. How many of those hours were devoted to teaching you to fly safely at low altitude, maybe just above the ground or just above the water? Yeah, for almost all of us, the answer is zero. And yet the accident statistics prove that pilots decide to go flying close to the ground, even though they have zero training on how to do it. Does that make any sense? I mean, why would you go out and do something dangerous without thoroughly investigating the risk first and without first getting some training? And for sure, anyone who plans to fly close to the ground should do just that. They should plan it ahead of time. People that need to fly close to the ground, you know, including crop dusters, pipeline patrol, uh, seaplanes, uh, they do just that. They plan ahead. 
in the years when I was actively flying seaplanes, I never went into a new body of water without fully scoping it out ahead of time. And for me, that meant researching any restrictions on landing on that body of water. It meant researching all the wires in the area. For example, I remember going to the internet to Google Maps at maps.google.com when I was scouting out a seaplane landing area in the Delta, which is a large series of interconnected waterways here in the middle of California's Central Valley. And while you might not see the small wires on Google Maps, you can often see the towers and other support structures for the wires. Not only that, you can also make some estimate of the height of the towers by measuring the lengths of the shadows cast by the towers on Google Maps. Now, to get really accurate, you need to figure out approximately what date and time the satellite photo was taken so that you can figure out the sun position. And then you can use some trigonometry to figure out the approximate height of the tower based on the shadow length. But of course, if the satellite photo was taken somewhere around noon, well, the shadows are going to be very small, which is going to make it harder to spot those towers in the photo and also make it impossible to figure out their heights. Now, just a couple of minutes ago, I went and I spent about five minutes looking for wires at Tullock Lake, which is where the accident pilot we talked about in the news crashed. I first looked at Google Maps, but I didn't spot any wires. But then I pulled up the sectional chart for the area on skyvector.com. <laughs> There they were, right there on the FAA sectional chart. I found a line of wires that crosses the lake in two different places. Now, then I went back to Google Maps, and I instantly spotted a line that had been cut through the trees to make a path for the wires. And from there, I could easily figure out where the wires crossed the lake in both locations. And then I was surprised to see when I zoomed in far enough, I could see the actual wires themselves where they crossed over the water at both locations. So if you choose to fly close to the ground, there are things you can do to identify wires and obstacles ahead of time to reduce some, but not all of the risk. While researching this article, I came across an accident report in which the pilot had been flying close to the ground in preparation for landing his aircraft at an event near an arena at some point in the future. And in the process of scouting the area to look for wires, yeah, he hit wires and crashed. So you've got to understand that when you're in flight, most wires cannot be seen until you're on top of them and it's too late to avoid them. So it's probably safer to do your research from the ground first before you go into the air. Now, I was able to find those wires at Tullock Lake in just five minutes here from the safety of my desk, but there may be smaller, lower wires that I didn't find. And I would spend a heck of a lot more time than five minutes doing research if I were actually planning to fly low over Tullock Lake. Now, I remember spending hours poring over satellite photos of Lake Berryessa and the diagrams from the Seaplane Pilots Association and getting every scrap of information I could find about landing a plane in Lake Berryessa. And when I flew, I would always stay high above the southern end of the lake because that's where most of the wires were, as well as all the various little tiny canyons. So when I learned a couple of years ago that an Icon A5 seaplane had crashed in the south end of Lake Berryessa, my instant thought was that they'd hit some of the wires in that end of the lake. Eventually, it was learned that they were flying low over the water and turned up one of the many blind canyons at that end of the lake. The two Icon employees on board died in what to me seemed like a senseless accident because the dangers that killed them were knowable in advance with just a little research. But you know, wires are just one of the many dangers associated with flying close to the ground. Here's another one that my friend Captain Ron mentioned to me when I stopped by his workplace at Google just yesterday. He mentioned that there have been some accidents in Alaska where pilots were circling game close to the ground at low altitude when their aircraft has suddenly rolled and crashed. Now, it took me a moment to realize why. Ron said the winds were calm and the aircraft were flying relatively tight turns around the game that they were looking at below. Then they encountered a problem pilots don't have when they're flying at normal altitudes. Apparently, these pilots hit their own wake turbulence and crashed. Now, I've hit my own wake turbulence when flying a steep turn, but the FAA requires us to teach those above 1,500 feet AGL. But when you're very close to the ground, the wakes don't dissipate as quickly because they can't drop down into lower altitudes. So flying close to the ground, it's just fraught with all kinds of dangers that don't affect pilots when they're flying at normal altitudes. And by the way, here I am preaching against flying low to the ground. I really do walk the talk. In my 40 years of flying, I can't remember ever flying within 500 feet of the ground except to land an aircraft. And now that you know how dangerous it can be to fly close to the ground, you got to wonder, is that something you really want to do on the spur of the moment without any planning or research ahead of time, simply because it looks fun or gives you an adrenaline rush? 
and when I say that you really shouldn't be doing it, I'm not saying it's always illegal to fly close to the ground. In many cases, it's perfectly legal to fly just five feet above the ground, but in other cases, it's not. For example, I think pilots often forget that FAR 91.119, which talks about minimum safe altitudes, also says that you must always operate an aircraft at an altitude that allows, if a power unit fails, an emergency landing without undue hazard to persons or property on the surface. But regardless of whether flying low is legal or not, you have to ask yourself whether it's a smart thing to do and whether it's worth the additional risk. <laughs> Let's talk for a moment about that risk. When you think about the risk, remember it's not just risk to you in your life. It's a risk to your family or other passengers who might be in the airplane with you when you choose to fly low and accidentally hit some wires. But also think about the loved ones who you'll leave behind, those who weren't in the airplane with you. Do you really want them to go through the sorrow of your death simply because you get a thrill out of flying close to the ground? And yes, I'm sure there are pilots who've flown close to the ground dozens of times without a problem, and they think that I'm being overly cautious. So let me ask you this. At what point would the level of risk be worth it in your mind where you would say, sure, I'm going to fly close to the ground because there's only a, say, one in 50 chance of crashing. Would that be safe enough for you to do it? Or would you want it to be maybe a one in a 100 chance of crashing? Think of it this way. If that were the risk and you flew close to the ground every month, in 50 months or slightly over four years, you'd have reached a 50% chance of crashing because of all those flights close to the ground. I don't know about you, but a 1 in 100 chance of crashing still wouldn't be good enough for me to go fly low over the ground. And even if it were a 1 in 1,000 chance of crashing, that still wouldn't be worth it to me. Because people win the lottery every day, and their chances of winning are much worse than 1 in 1,000. So let's be careful out there. If you do feel the need to fly low to the ground, at least research it carefully ahead of time so that you can eliminate some of the risk. Coming up next, listener feedback, right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And here we go with listener feedback. This comes from Charlie in Northern California. He says... You ask about feedback on people who were using basic med, and that's true. A few episodes back, I asked folks to write in. Uh, this week is the second anniversary of my basic med, and it has been a lifesaver for me. I suffer from atrial fibrillation, otherwise known as AFib, and occasional heart arrhythmia, which, with proper medication and medical supervision, is a non-issue. Using my third-class medical, I required a special issuance, and every time I had a reoccurrence, about once a year for the past 15 years, I would have to wait 90 days and more recently, 30 days before I could reapply, plus a bunch of medical tests, and then the processing time with the FAA was from two to three months. Every year, I was down a minimum of three months up to five months. This was a very difficult time, especially as my cardiologist, who works with a lot of pilots, thought these rules were ridiculous. He told me a 24-hour break is all that was needed. Fortunately, when basic med came out, atrial fibrillation was not on their list of concerns, so as long as I followed the basic med protocols, flying was up to me with the advice of my cardiologist. I've had two or three incidents in the last two years, and for each one I took only two days off from flying. My only regret is that Canada does not recognize our basic med, thus I can't fly up and visit my son in Toronto. When you mention basic med, be sure to remind everyone that they have to take the course every two years. I totally forgot until I filled out the insurance company form for Rogers A36, a friend of his. I'm catching up on some old episodes during my runs and was taken with the one regarding the engine issue near Potomac, hearing the composure of the student pilot on the radio, as well as the dedication and professionalism on the part of the controller was impressive. So glad to hear that this pilot is on her way toward an aviation career. And yes, Charlie, I met her when I was at AOPA in Frederick uh, last month, and uh, she is she's going to do great in the aviation world, I'm sure of that. Here's one from Richard in Illinois. He says, Max, I enjoy your show. In episode 107, you mentioned it might not be good to head toward an airport with an unpaved runway. I find that in my Cessna 170B, landing on grass is much more forgiving than landing on pavement, so in daylight, unpaved would be my preference if it were available in an emergency situation. Good point. Uh, yes, in fact, it's also going to save your tires a little bit. My, my flight instructor used to always land on the grass when I was getting my private because he knew that uh, it would reduce the wear and tear on his tires. Here's one from Caitlin in Wisconsin. She says, hi, my name is Caitlin. I'm a 19-year-old student pilot. The last episode you talked about avoiding mid-air and near mid-air collisions. After listening to that episode, I had a flight lesson two days later. During my lesson, I was reminded twice of what you talked about in the episode. The first time was when I was preparing to do a power-off stall. 
As I was setting up, I noticed an aircraft about 1,500 feet below me and a couple miles out. We then waited to see what maneuver the aircraft was performing, and it began to make a turn, and it appeared he was headed in our direction. My instructor swiftly took the controls and maneuvered away from the possible hazard while I was looking for traffic. The second instance was when we were approaching the airport for landing, a non-towered airport. As we were approaching, two aircraft were heading from the north with intentions to land on runway 18. We were planning on entering a right downwind for the runway from the southwest. As we approached the airport, we could not see traffic and some confusing calls were made by the two other inbound aircraft. Still not knowing and not being able to identify the traffic, we entered the downwind. As we were on the downwind, I remembered how you said that most of the time near midair or midair collisions occur when aircraft are heading in the same direction and also in the traffic pattern, I'll add. I then told my instructor that I was not comfortable with the situation we were in, and we exited the pattern to make another attempt to identify the traffic. Though we would have been fine to stay in the pattern, I always like to stay on the safe side. Good for you, Caitlin. I totally agree with you. You know, when you have two choices, whenever you're flying, pick the more conservative or the safer one. Always makes sense, even if it delays you a little bit. Far better than, you know, finding yourself in an accident. And here's a message from Graham in Rhode Island. He says, regarding the theft of avionics at uh, Mansfield Airport uh, a year ago. He says, also hit that night were KSFZ, North Central, and KUUU, Newport. Planes affected were at far ends of tie-downs away from lights and security cams. Tremont radios, especially King Navcoms, were popular, probably because parts are getting hard to get, and they are an easy removal. And from Stefan in New York, he says, Hi, Max. Just listening to episode 110. Very sorry to hear about your client's icing accident. I have to admit, this is probably my worst fear as a CFI. Flight instruction for me is a labor of love, but unlike when flying myself, the risk is diffuse, affecting future flights of students. This is especially true with icing, which, as you know, we have a lot of in the Syracuse area. During the last few years, as I have tried to expand my own comfort envelope, I have been very conscious about the role model I might be setting for other pilots. They might catch me flying in marginal conditions without the benefit of the thought process exploring all possible outs, and might end up flying in similar conditions, but without the outs. I very much appreciate that you talk about this openly. You might want to consider an advice to CFI episode on how to deal with this responsibility. Again, my condolences, and I very much appreciate the show. Thanks so much, Stefan. really appreciate that. And let's see, this comes from Anders in Livermore, California. And coincidentally, I talked with Anders this past weekend. He's got an interesting project that he's working on. Hope that works out well for him. But this came in a while ago, and he said... I recently listened to one of your older episodes about a Piper accident at the Reed Hillview Airport caused by improperly rigged ailerons. Early in my flight training, I often completed the flight controls free and correct checklist item without sufficient emphasis on the correct part. Especially for the ailerons, it can be a mental challenge to visualize the proper action of the control surfaces. At some point, I saw another pilot use the memory aid thumbs up to identify that when turning the yoke, your thumb will point toward the aileron that should be in an upward orientation. I found this to be extremely helpful, and I now make this call out during the flight controls check before every flight, although not sure how well this works for Cirrus pilots. Thanks for all the hard work and effort you put on the podcast, and keep up the great work. And Anders, that's exactly what I teach, and it works perfectly fine for Cirrus pilots. Uh, yes, as you're doing your control check, when you turn the yoke one way, keep your thumb sticking straight up and it will be pointing at the aileron that should be up. By the way, you can also make this check where you're out pre-flighting. As you're walking around the airplane, go ahead and move the aileron up and look inside to see if the yoke has turned towards you. Here's an email from Rami in Georgia. He says regarding 106, avoiding midairs, my new pet peeve is pilots announcing on the CTAF, November 123XX, taxing from ramp three to the active. <laughs> don't care, don't need to know, and he probably just blocked the pattern position report that I do need to know about, just saying. Thanks for that, Rami, and yes, I totally agree. Some of these transmissions are totally unnecessary. Now let's go to listener questions. Hey, Max, good morning. This is Brett in Kansas with a couple questions for you about the use of carburetor heat. I was taught to always use carburetor heat when coming in on a, a landing which I've always done. Whether it's cold or warm, I've always done it. Just get, I got in the habit of it. Is that correct? Regardless of the weather conditions, should we always use carburetor heat when coming in on landing? Second part of the question is, is I was uh, talking to a pilot the other day, and he indicated that he always used carburetor heat when flying in rain. Now, that's a new one. 
Uh, is that true? So that would be an interesting topic to get resolution on, especially for those of us that are uh, going to be flying to Oshkosh. And uh, many times we run into a, a bit of rain on the way to Oshkosh. Max, keep up the good work and thank you. Brett, thanks for your question. Now, I learned to fly back in the 1970s on a Cessna 150, and I was always taught to use carburetor heat in that plane when I landed. I have read that carburetor ices no longer form once the temperature gets above 80 degrees, but I've also read accident reports that said the carburetor ice was responsible at 80 degrees. So on really hot days, apparently you don't have to use carburetor heat when landing, but I would do it anyway. I don't think there's any downside in using it, so... Why not have it on just in case you run into carburetor ice even on a relatively hot day? Now, not all aircraft POHs say the same thing about this. I remember in a Piper Warrior that I flew years ago, the PH said, and I'll read it here, quote, carburetor heat should not be applied unless there is an indication of carburetor icing, since the use of carburetor heat causes a reduction of power, which may be critical in case of a go-around. Full throttle operation with heat on is likely to cause detonation. Yet, here's the problem the way I see it, Brett. By the time you detect carburetor icing, it may be too late to turn on the carb heat to solve the problem. A key thing to know is that you really want to turn on carburetor heat before you reduce the throttle setting to land. I was always taught to pull the carburetor heat on when I was a beam the middle of the field on downwind, and then reduce the throttle later when I was a beam the numbers at the approach end of the runway. If you were to do the opposite, that is first pull the throttle and then turn on the carburetor heat, well, you're going to get very little heat into the carburetor because the heat is only generated at higher power settings of the throttle. So in my mind, it would make sense to use carb heat on any aircraft that has that control every time you land. But I'm not an expert in all aircraft, so you may want to consult with someone who is an expert for the type of aircraft that you fly. And I don't, by the way, claim to be an expert on carb heat anymore because I almost never fly planes with carburetor heat because these days I only teach in glass cockpit aircraft and all the newer airplanes with glass cockpits are fuel ejected and don't use a carburetor. Now, as for using carburetor heat in the rain, you're going to find two schools of thought on this. I've read that some people say you never have to worry about getting carb heat in rain in a Cessna 172 because of the way the carburetor is mounted in the aircraft, the rain droplets would never be able to rise up into the carburetor. However, I can tell you that I have had carburetor ice in 182 while flying IFR in heavy rain. That flight was back in the 1990s, and multiple times during that flight when I noticed the RPM dropping, I would turn on the carburetor heat, which would eliminate the ice, and then I would turn the carburetor heat off again and wait for the RPM to drop. So that happened several times while I was in that to aircraft. So I frankly believe you can get carburetor ice in the rain. Now, here's what I read from a Cessna 172M POH about all of this. In the POH, it says, and I quote, carburetor ice, as evidenced by an unexplained drop in RPM, can be removed by application of full carburetor heat. Upon regaining the original RPM with heat off, use the minimal amount of heat by trial and error to prevent ice from forming. Since the heated air causes a richer mixture, readjust the mixture setting when carburetor heat is to be used continuously in cruise flight. The use of full carburetor heat is recommended during flight in heavy rain to avoid the possibility of engine stoppage due to excessive water ingestion or carburetor ice. The mixture setting should be readjusted for smoothest operation. In extremely heavy rain, the use of partial carburetor heat, control approximately two-thirds out, and part throttle, closed at least one inch, may be necessary to retain adequate power. Power changes should be made cautiously followed by prompt adjustment of the mixture for smoothest operation. So, Brett, I hope that helps, and I hope you have a very safe flight on your way to Oshkosh this summer. Here's a question from Robert in my home state of Pennsylvania. He says in episode 109 about near midair collisions, you mentioned being on the upwind leg. I hear departure leg and upwind leg often used interchangeably, even by ATC. So I'd appreciate your distinction of these two terms and a discussion of the importance of that distinction. I'm a relatively new student pilot. Listen to about 10 different aviation podcasts, and yours is the most educational. Keep up the great work. Well, thanks, Robert. That makes me feel quite good, so thanks for sharing that with me. So the reason we have both of those terms is, I would say, simply because of lack of consistency of the FAA, but I know that they're working on resolving this. So if you look at the controller's handbook, they use the term upwind leg, and the term departure leg doesn't even appear in the controller's handbook. 
By contrast, if you go to the PHAC, the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, which is the book published by the FAA used by private pilots and student pilots, it uses the term upwind leg and really doesn't make much mention of the departure leg. So we have two different sources and hence you hear both of those terms. Now, I have read that the FAA is looking to uh, resolve this and make it consistent. I think they're going for the departure leg term, which I think is unfortunate because I prefer upwind leg. I think departure makes it sound like you are leaving the traffic pattern and you might be on the departure leg, but staying in the traffic pattern. In terms of how important the distinction is between those two, I certainly am not too concerned if I hear one versus the other. The important thing, of course, is that you know what you mean and that you always communicate clearly. So I want to thank Robert for his question. And hey, if you are interested in buying any model of Cirrus airplane or jet or are interested in flight training in one, please contact me now for a free consultation. In some cases, I can arrange a free demo flight for you. And I'm always happy to talk with anyone about Cirrus. We can talk about the ins and outs of buying new versus used. Just give me a call, 650-967-2500, or go to aviationnewstalk.com and click on contact at the top of the website. And you can also use that form to leave listener questions or give us any feedback. I specialize in Cirrus and work with people around the world. And finally, here's one way that I'd really ask for your help. Please tell a friend about Aviation News Talk. And if they don't know what a podcast is, we'll just show them on their phone how they can download the dedicated app from the App Store, either on the Google App Store or the Google Play Store, by typing in Aviation News Talk in the search bar and then downloading the free app. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. 